possible to push the button, Rosa? Not yet, yes? Okay. Hello, everyone. Let me uh, get actually uh, here. Let me get the image right. Welcome to this uh, third uh, YouTube Live where uh, we are talking about um, the related questions to the videos of the Wake Up Your Eyes uh, four-part free masterclass that we are uh, sharing this time. I'm going to ask the team to keep letting people in the Zoom room, please, then I don't have to pay attention at that. And uh, you will probably uh, let me know how things are going in YouTube, what people are saying, where they're from. And that's the first question that I would like to ask you. Uh, where are you watching us from? Um, we uh, have been receiving lots of comments and messages. Uh, we've had thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of people watching uh, the Wake Up Your Eyes free course in, in Spanish, in English. We're actually doing both at the same time. And uh, we have also received lots of messages of people being very grateful and thankful because uh, the lessons are eye-opening, literally, very clear and, uh, and uh, not using technical uh, language so that everyone can understand. And if you're watching this for the first time and you have not yet uh, registered to the Wake Up Your Eyes um, free course, um, I'm going to ask the team to let you see the URL, so that you, the link, so that you can get in, yeah? You still have time, uh, we're still leaving the classes available for a few more days, and you can probably uh, catch up this weekend. If you haven't yet watched video number one, video number two, and video number three, I would like to invite you to do so. And you can also look at the lives that we did on YouTube, and this could be a good moment, if you haven't done it yet, to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can also push like to this video or something. And you are still in time to share with your beloved people. Uh -huh. You can, this weekend, for example, organize a kind of a watch party uh, and you can share what you have discovered um, with everyone that you know that has problems with their eyes, that is wearing glasses or has had surgery or, or would like to avoid surgery, yeah? And, uh, and use it. And if you have already watched video number one, video number two, video number three, and you have been learning the techniques and applying the techniques and understanding the ideas, you very likely are already noticing the great effect that it has in your vision. Again, we have received lots of uh, messages of people being very, very happy, uh, very thankful because literally, uh, there's a veil dropping from in front of their eyes. They're, they're, it's really eye-opening, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, lots of people are not only seeing much better, but they're understanding why they didn't see well and then having the keys so that they can keep having good eyesight uh, for life. Uh, as we mentioned in the second video and in the second live, Lots of people believe things that are false, that are actually partially true and partially um, uh, mistaken, such as that eyesight necessarily goes bad with age. That's not true. It's statistically frequent, but that doesn't mean that it is biologically determined. Or so lots of people believe that once that you start using glasses, you can only keep wearing them or wear stronger and uh, glasses for worse and worse eyesight, and that's not true. Some people have limiting beliefs about how young or how old you could uh, improve your eyesight, your vision, and you can improve your eyesight at any age, from six months old, as it was my case, into uh, um, 60, 70, 80, 90, and any age in between, as we've had many, many cases and uh, people of people and their testimonials of people improving their vision at any age. It's also possible to improve your eyesight, your vision, whether you have never had surgery or if you have already had surgery and your eyesight deteriorated because of the surgery or after the surgery, in any case, you can improve your eyesight. Uh -huh. And there's lots and lots of comments, hundreds, thousands of comments in Spanish, hundreds of comments in English under the videos of people improving their eyesight. Um, uh, just with what they're learning with these free classes. Uh -huh. And um, if it's not your case yet, if you are not yet seeing very fast progress, you also need to understand that this is a process. It's not like pushing a button or, or taking a pill or laser. 
it is a process, it takes time, sometimes it takes more time, sometimes it takes less time, but it needs your commitment, your understanding, your practice, your presence, your attention, uh -huh, so that you can observe how the improvements keep adding up and how you see better and better. Uh -huh. But it's rarely a process that goes from black to white. Uh -huh. It goes from black into different shades of gray and then uh, into white, yeah, so to say. And actually, usually the process is not like this, it's more like this. So there's some improvements and then you get a bit stuck and then you improve again when you understand something and then you um, maybe are stuck a, a little bit again, but then you have another improvement. So the perseverance is absolutely necessary. And also relaxation. It's really important to do everything with relaxation. Relaxation is the key number one for vision improvement. Uh -huh. Everything that you can do relaxed uh -huh. will improve your eyesight. Even if you have too many expectations and you're anxious about getting a good eyesight, that could be on the way of having a good vision. Yeah? So you need to relax, to persevere, but to be relaxed. And one good thing to do with this is to take it as a game, uh -huh, as an, exper some, an experiment, something that you try to see with this curious and joyful attitude that children have when they're playing. Uh -huh. Okay, so. This is a, a bit uh, of context, but uh, so we're having this time together today and we're going uh, to talk about a couple of things that are very interesting. Well, first, if you still have questions about whether natural vision improvement could help you in your specific particular case, you can ask them. Uh -huh. And maybe uh, some of uh, the people from my team who are here, let me show you a little bit. I'm in the room with 14 more people and a few of them are former participants of the ClearSight Method advanced program and some of them are from my team. We have Anna, uh, Rosa, Petra who are here with me and uh, they're also Angela and um, Jaime are usually in YouTube on the other side. So if you ask your questions uh, it is very likely that my team directly answers to the questions. Yeah. And uh, they will also give a number of the questions to me so that I can answer them for everyone uh, during the live. So if you have questions, type them down because you have an opportunity here to have the um, answer to that question. And uh, the other important thing is that if you've been following the Wake Up Your Eyes um, four-part free masterclass, uh, you saw how in the first video we talked about the pioneering research by Dr. William Bates and we understood how and why it's possible uh, to recover uh, from um, the most common eye problems such as myopia being short-sighted, nearsighted, or hyperopia being far-sighted, or presbyopia needing reading glasses with age that's common, or astigmatism which creates distorted lines and distorted vision. Uh -huh. because these are due mostly to tension in certain groups of muscles in the eyes. Uh -huh. This is one of the discoveries that Dr. William Bates did. And so with relaxation, you can relax those muscles and your focusing uh, and your visual acuity improves greatly. Uh -huh. So this was uh, the focus of video number one and you've been practicing palming to relax your eyes and you have seen that the sensations in your eyes improve and that you see more and you see better. And in the second video, <clears throat> we talked about the importance of light, of sunlight, uh -huh. and we dropped again some false or limiting beliefs around uh, what is possible for improving the eyesight. And if you practice the sunning technique, and if you were in the YouTube live and you learned the instant focusing technique, you learned again a lot of tools that you can use to improve your vision instantly, super fast, very quickly, and again, these are cumulative and then you improve your vision more and more and more every day. And in the third video, and today we're going to talk about this, we went into something much deeper. We went into how the cause of the tension in the muscles of the eyes, in at least 80% of the cases, it is due to emotional strain, to stress, to tension. Uh -huh. And we're going to talk about scientific research around this, but beyond that, so you understand it better, but beyond that we're going to talk about at least 15 different vision symptoms so that if you have one of those you can understand what's the metaphor or the message or the emotional strain that probably was or is 
behind this vision symptom that you have developed. And in this case, you're going to be able to check for yourself um, if that is true, if it makes sense, and have a key to release the tension mm -hmm, and improve your vision greatly and, uh, yeah, and much more permanently. Yeah? So the key point or the new material that we're going to deliver in this live is talking about those 15 uh, vision symptoms. So we're going to talk about the most common and we're going to talk about those that we have got been receiving more questions on, yeah? So, yeah, so we really look forward to answering to all your questions. And now, I would like to know, uh, after this first introduction, well, I see that I have uh, 14 people here in the room with me. I'd like to know where people are coming from. Hey, Mike is saying hi. Hello, Mike. Uh, there's um, some 33 people on YouTube at this moment. Our channel in, uh, in English, our YouTube channel in English is um, actually being born. Um, we have over 44,000, almost 45,000 people in Spanish. And every time we do a live, we have close to 1,000 people. And in 24 hours, there's like 7,000 people who watch it. In English, things are still, for the moment, going a bit slow. But still, it's very nice to have you. And uh, we're always interested to know where you come from. Let me see uh, what do we have here. We have people from Illinois, from Belgium, Ontario, Canada, New Zealand, from Florida, from Marbella, Spain. Okay, great. And um, oh, it's 43 people now. Great, wonderful. So it's, uh, it keeps going up. Very, very good. And uh, Anna or Petra, what do you say? Where should we start talking in this live today? If you put your up, your mic, Anna. Today you're looking to the front. It's much nicer than when you're looking to the side. Very nice to see you. Well, I really like the introduction you have made because it's a very important structure, the time, the process, Mm -hmm. And now, as the main topic is emotions, why they are so important in vision also. Mm -hmm. Because not many people know about this relationship and how important it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't know, don't even imagine that there is such a relationship between uh, eye problems, vision problems, and uh, the different moments in your life where you have lived things with stress. And um, this information, I have personally done uh, scientific research on it uh, from the University of Toulouse um, a few years ago with a colleague of mine, um, uh, a doctor, Dr. Anastasia Meidani, also who works at the University of Toulouse. She's a sociologist that specialized in sociology of health and sociology of the body. Together, we carried research with 450 people uh, where we were asking people when uh, did their first vision problem start, what, how old they were. And as I'm asking these questions, I would like to ask you to ask yourself that question. So when did your first symptom uh, of your eyesight, of your vision start? How old were you? So that's the first question. The second question is, what was going on at that time in your life? What was happening? What was happening for you personally? What was happening for the family? What was happening in society? Uh -huh. what, what happened at that time? And uh, when we asked this in the research, we found out that for 82% of the people in the research, their vision problems started at a time when they lived some, most of the time, some change with stress and tension. Yeah, there was something happening in their life uh, that they lived uh, with, with anguish, uh, pain, stress, tension. And um, there was an additional 6% of people who said, no, nothing particular, my father died. No, nothing strange, I, got, um, uh, I lost my job. Mm, I cannot think of anything particular, I went to live to another country. Uh, so it was very <laughs> surprising and, uh, and very uh, impressive to see that there was an additional 6% of people who, although they said that there was nothing particular happening 
immediately after they did mention something that could be thought of as a stressful situation, a painful situation or challenging situation. So if we add those up, then it would be 88% of the people could identify a stressful situation at the moment where the vision started declining. And for the remaining 12%, uh, people said um, they couldn't really find anything. So we don't know if they just didn't remember, uh, which could be a possibility that something happened and they didn't remember because it was a long time ago and they couldn't talk with anyone that was around at that time that could refresh their memory or something. Or maybe nothing really happened. It could be that it's not something that happens 100% of the time. But still, 88% of vision problems starting with a challenge in life is a big number enough so that we consider this very seriously. Yeah? Because in most cases, we have here an opportunity uh, for a transformation, for a positive transformation. And that's the experience we've been having with the ClearSight method. And, uh, but I also have to say and acknowledge that uh, this finding, I'm working with it and I'm fine-tuning the hypothesis and of course fine-tuning the methods and the tools to uh, solve vision problems from this emotional point of view. But I have to give credit to the person who first started this line of research. And that was Dr. Charles Kelly. Uh -huh. Dr. Charles Kelly did his research in 1958. He had uh, first had a very strong myopia and um, he had the chance to bump uh, with, uh, to find um, Margaret Darcy Corbett, who was a direct disciple of Dr. William Bates. She was actually uh, probably one of the favorite disciples of Dr. William Bates. Um, uh, she met him in his uh, late um, part of his work. Um, and because she had a background in education, she was the person who created a method of teaching or transmission of the Bates method. Yeah? So Margaret Darcy Corbett was very important in the history of the Bates method because she was the person who diffused it to a lot of people, who trained a lot of vision educators, but also had a lot of clients. And while Dr. William Bates started his uh, career in the state of New York and then moved on uh, to other parts of the country, uh, Margaret Darcy Corbett lived in LA in California uh, so she had the opportunity um, to help lots of Hollywood stars, lots of actors and actresses, and even the famous writer Aldous Huxley, the writer of A Brave New World. I don't know if you had to read it in high school. I had, so uh, I see very well who he is. And um, Aldous Huxley became blind at the age of 16 uh, because he had keratitis punctata, and uh, he had like dark glasses, sunglasses, and walked with a, um, with a cane and a dog, I mean, and red braille and all of that. And when he found about um, Margaret Dars Corbett, he started working with her, and he managed to have functional, uh, functional vision without glasses. So he went from being blind, legally blind, considered legally blind, into being functional without glasses which was absolutely amazing for him. So he wrote this book called The Art of Seeing that you can still find uh, in 1942, at a time where Margaret Darcy Corbett was being challenged by uh, op um, opticians and optometrists uh, who didn't like uh, losing their clients uh, to someone who taught people how to see well naturally. And so um, Margaret Darcy Corbett went into a trial. She won. Lots of uh, the clients and the Hollywood stars supported her. And um, Aldous Huxley wrote this book. So this is all historically documented if you want to have a look at it. Um, so I'm setting the context where um, Charles Kelly found out about Margaret Darcy Corbett and uh, he went from being very myopic, uh, short-sighted, nearsighted, into recovering normal a functional vision without glasses, okay? And um, Charles Kelly was very fascinated by this and uh, he went on to study psychology. That was his field of interest. And when he was studying psychology, he found the works, so he was very familiar with the Bates method and the Bates findings because of his work on his own myopia. And when he studied psychology, um, he found out about Wilhelm Reich, the theories and the methods of Wilhelm Reich. And Wilhelm Reich was um, 
a medical doctor, he was a psychiatrist who had been trained in psychoanalysis. He was one of the followers of Sigmund Freud, but who became a heterodox, who went into other lines of thought. Uh -huh. And um, Wilhelm Reich is also a very fascinating figure that had lots of interesting ideas, but we're going to focus on one that is interesting for us at this moment. And one of the things that Wilhelm Reich found was that whenever a person experiences an emotion and um, this person blocks or inhibits the full cycle of the emotion, the emotion that hasn't been fully lived, fully experienced, fully expressed or fully integrated, remains in the body as muscle tension. Yeah? So, for example, if your father dies and your mother goes into depression or your brother, sisters and brothers are little and uh, you have to become the strong figure of the family, then your father dies, you keep yourself from being sad or from crying so that you can support the whole family system. So this sadness that you, has, you have not expressed because the context required it, uh, remains in your body as muscle tension. Yeah? And um, sometimes um, these things can be an event, like what I just said, uh, something happens and you, uh, you freeze your emotion, you don't express it, maybe because it's required for the moment, or maybe it's because of how we are uh, socialized, how we're educated, uh -huh. the, the norms and the social beliefs uh, about how women should be or how men should be or, or, or how sons or daughters have to behave or how parents have to behave or how you have to behave in certain professional roles. And so there's many situations in life where we're experiencing something, we're living something, something stressful, and sometimes we are obliged by the situation to freeze the emotion. So, and if, if this happens over and over and over and over, these muscle tensions become contractures and they absolutely do change your posture. So one of the findings of Wilhelm Reich was that you can, by watching the posture of a person and watching if he's like this or like this or like this, uh -huh. watching the posture of a person and where this person has accumulated muscle tension, you can uh, uh, hypothesize or, or guess what kind of emotions this person is systematically suppressing, repressing. Uh -huh. And so he talked about, and maybe I'm not going to use the proper English expression, although Wilhelm Reich uh, wrote in English, but I studied all of this in Spanish, he talked about um, um, character armors or muscle armors, yes? And, and that is how by repressing certain emotions, you create such a muscle structure, such a posture, that you can find out how a person has learned to be and to repress and to express by the shape of the body, yeah? And uh, again, there's lots of different beliefs around how emotions uh, uh, should be handled and you hear a lot the expression of negative emotions as if fear or anger or sadness were doing something bad for us and they all have a function, they all have a reason, they're all for our good but not all the families or all the cultures or all the um, societal environments are comfortable handling with the different emotions. And I don't know for you, but I have heard a lot around me, and it's true in many, in many societies. Uh, for example, uh, hearing say that men don't cry, so men shouldn't be sad or men shouldn't be afraid. And, in, and for example, a counterpart for women is that they should never be angry. So, but we're all, all of those things, depending on the moment, yeah, and what's going on. But if these emotions are systematically repressed, they tend to accumulate as muscle tensions in the body. And guess what? That happens in the eyes as well. We already explained that focusing happens because of uh, the oblique muscles and the straight muscles and the ciliary muscles and the iris and the pupil is also a muscle that regulates uh, how much light there is and that helps focusing. So if we have all these emotions that are stored in our body, um, well, they can be uh, blocking our capacity um, to see well. And actually, this is the research, 
and the theory, the hypothesis that um, Charles Kelly developed. Uh -huh. He was familiar with the Bates theories on uh, how the oblique muscles and the straight muscles participate in focusing, but also in creating myopia and hyperopia and presbyopia and astigmatism. And on the other hand, he became familiar uh, with this theory by Wilhelm Wright about the fact that when you don't digest the emotions, you don't express them, you don't integrate them, they remain in your body as muscle tension. So then he asked himself, if focusing depends on the functioning of muscles in the eyes, but the muscles in the eyes or the muscles everywhere in the body can be disturbed by emotions that haven't been fully expressed, what if behind every eye symptom there is a specific emotion that's hiding there? Yeah? And so this is the research that he carried throughout his PhD that he did um, in the um, New School of Social Research of the State of New York in collaboration with the University of Columbia, the Department of Ophthalmology in the, in the University of Columbia. And his research was so outstanding that he won the prize for the best dissertation of the year. Yeah, and uh, so he won a prize for this research. Uh, he published his um, research in uh, journals, scientific journals in psychology, in optometry. He was on TV, he was on the radio in New York, in California. He was on, in the New York Times, in the Time magazine. So his research became very famous at the moment and very recognized by the scientific community. However, it's interesting to notice that this very important research didn't have any impact at all on how ophthalmology or optometry is practiced. And the only professional community uh, interested in eyesight and uh, vision that um, integrated the information from uh, uh, Charles Kelly's research was the community of vision educators. So these ideas are more spread actually in North America than in other communities of vision educators in Europe, for example. Uh, I'm, I see more often my colleagues in English talk about the importance of emotions in vision than uh, the European colleagues. Uh -huh. But in any case, it, it is there. It's part of uh, the knowledge that we use and we work with. And um, what's interesting is that, well, Charles Kelly found this first connection and he articulated both theories and he did this very important research. And there's been others after him who have been working on this. And one of them uh, is Dr. Martin Brofman. Dr. Martin Brofman was American and he ended up, he, he spent at least 30 years of his later life in Europe. And I had the chance to read his books um, over 20 years ago and participate in his courses for about 20 years. And uh, actually for seven years in a row, I translated all his classes in Spain. He didn't speak Spanish. So I was his personal translator for all his courses. And he tended to say uh, that what I did was not translation. It was like a tantric dance, as if one consciousness was going through two different bodies in a bilingual way. So he considered that his, my translations were absolutely precise. Uh -huh. So Martin Brofman developed further um, the system of hypothesis or the charting of what emotion is behind each eye symptom. Mm -hmm. And this is the model with which I have been working, I have been continuing the research, and the one that I can share, because it's the one that makes the most sense uh, for me and the one that I know the best. So um, this is what I'm going to go uh, to dive into. Uh, if you watch video number three, in video number three, we talked about already the meaning of four eye symptoms, myopia, hyperopia, um, um, presbyopia and astigmatism. So we're going to review those four very quickly and we're going to talk about many other symptoms as well. Yeah, And uh, I would like to know if at this point there's anything that I should mention or any particular question, Anna or Luhan or Petra, is there something you'd like to highlight? They the are movie? very focused, listening to you. That is very nice of them. <laughs> Okay, thank you. thank you. Great. Yay. And for example, there's a comment from Mary, Mary from New Zealand, that says, myopia started after my father died. I was 11 years old. Yeah, indeed. Um, probably you were not ready at all 
to see something that hard so close to you. And so maybe we can start with myopia, yeah? We can start with symptoms uh, that start um, uh, when, you, when we're young. Myopia typically starts in childhood. Um, but before we go into the different symptoms, I would like to mention again, because this is important, that the information that I'm going to share, and maybe I'll talk a little bit also about my own story, or maybe some people that are here in the Zoom room with me will want to share some of their findings in their own personal journey of vision improvement and how emotions affected them and how through knowing about how emotions impact your eyesight, they could recover a lot of uh, vision. But what I want, to, I want for you to know before we dive into those 15 symptoms is that this will help you and this will work for you whether you have had surgery or not, whether you've had uh, glasses for many, many years or you just started using glasses recently, and even um, if you have the symptom from birth. Uh -huh. That's a question that we get uh, very often and maybe we can start at that point, yeah? And if you don't remember what was going on at the time when your vision symptoms started, because that happens for 12% of people, they don't really see any connection, don't worry. Well, you have two possibilities. One possibility is you can take the time to talk to people around you, to talk to people who knew you at that period of your life. Uh -huh. um, you can remember when you saw well, or you can remember happy periods of your life, and that will help you, even if you don't remember what the cause was. And the second thing is that even if you cannot establish a connection between your eyesight problem and stressful situations or emotions, don't worry, because we've been sharing with you and we'll keep sharing with you many other tools, many other exercises, practices, games that you can use that will help you improve your eyesight, because there's many angles that you can use to improve your eyesight. And actually, tomorrow we're going to release video number four, and in video number four we're going to talk about six angles or six levels from which you can improve your eyesight. And the emotional level is only one of them, so you have five more, yeah? You have five more other ways that you can use to improve your eyesight, yeah? So I would, I would encourage you and invite you to stay nevertheless in the live because maybe the, you will, like, there will be rings uh, belling, uh, no, <laughs> bells ringing, <laughs> or light bulbs uh, <laughs> lighting up, and you'll get ideas, um, even if you cannot think of a specific thing, you'll have some understanding if you listen. And if you do remember when it was and what was happening, it will definitely give you clarity. Now, I said that we would start with um, when people are born with symptoms. And if you remember uh, the, the stories I told about myself, I was born with strabismus, so with a big squint, uh, being very myopic with an, one eye, and the other one was amblyopic, which means that I was very short-sighted with one eye, and the other one the brain didn't even consider it existed. Yeah, So I was blind from one eye. And I was born with that. So what was happening? Actually, I hadn't had personally my own um, uh, life experiences, if you want, but when I was um, in my mother's belly, my mother was my universe, and my mother was experiencing a lot of stress during her pregnancy. So I caught the tensions that my mother was experiencing. So when people are born with symptoms, then the question is, what was going on in the life of the mother during the pre pregnancy? or the relationship between the mother and the father, or what was the climate in the family. Mm -hmm. And when you know that, you can understand. I could understand, even though we solved it in a different way, because we solved it between when I was six months old and one year old, uh, with uh, relaxation and exercises at the physical level. But when I got the information about what are the um, messages or the emotional causes behind the eye symptoms, I could understand why I was born with those symptoms. I could understand because I knew how the pregnancy was lived by my mother and how stressed and fearful she was during that period. Yeah? Okay, so let's go, let's go for these different symptoms. Uh, again, we're going to talk about... Um, about um, 
lots of them. And uh, if you're very interested about one that we don't mention, if we have time, we'll talk about it as well. And since Mary was mentioning, um, since M Mary was mentioning myopia that happened when she was 11 years old, we could start with that. Yeah. So one thing that I liked a lot about how Martin uh, explained the, the symptoms, he was very, um, yeah, he was very clear in the explanation. So let's imagine that this is our personal space, yeah? And so when we experience myopia or we're nearsighted or shortsighted, we see things that are near, but we don't see things that are far away. We don't see clearly things that are far away. So what are we doing with our energy? We're removing ourselves from a world that we perceive as threatening. Mm -hmm. We are hiding, we are freezing. Myopia, or nearsightedness, shortsightedness, appears uh, usually in childhood when there is some change for which the person is not yet ready. The person doesn't feel uh, trust or confidence or security enough to go through that change. So very often myopia will appear in situations like the ones I'm going to describe. For example, uh, somebody dies, like in Mary's case or many people's case, a grandparent or an uncle or a godparent, or in this case, well, it was the father. Somebody dying is something very stressful for children. They are not yet prepared uh, very often to deal with, uh, with death and what that means. Um, but also, if uh, the parents are arguing at home a lot, or if, they're, if, they, if they divorce, or if they move to another house or to another location, or another city or another region or another country when there's a movement like this. Um, but also a very, very, very typical moment for myopia to start is when you start school. Because you go from being at home, being comfy with your family and you know how it works, what the norms are, and all of a sudden you're surrounded by lots of strangers and the rules are different and you're obliged to pay attention to things that are maybe boring and uh, people insist on you paying attention to those things. So the school has been a, 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 a place of pr producing massive myopia. And it's, this is historically um, research as well. Uh -huh. There's a historical data of uh, levels of myopia increasing very highly with the uh, start of school. Um, but also the changes may not be something negative. For example, when a brother or a sister is born in the family, that's a typical moment for myopia to start as well. If the parents are shifting their attention to the newborn and the, uh, the, the kid is hesitating or wondering if, if he or she is still as loved as uh, he or she was before, that's a typical moment also for myopia to start. All the school cycle changes are typical beginners of myopia, uh -huh. uh, ending a school cycle and, and starting the following one. But also in, in teenage years, um, when um, uh, people start changing their hormones and stuff and they have to handle um, all the politics of attraction. Uh, I like him but he doesn't like me or I don't like him and he likes me or uh, does she like me, does he like me or not. Like all of this for some people is very stressful um, and that's a moment where people develop myopia. Um, so changes in cycles uh, at school but also ending school and starting uh, a job or changing a job. Mm -hmm. um, every time that there is a change of status, of role, um, it is a typical moment for people to start develop myo developing myopia if they didn't feel uh, confident enough or secure enough to um, go through that change. And another very, very typical moment to start myopia is for women when they're pregnant of their first child or the child number that exceeds the, the capacity they believe they have to, uh, to take care of children. So these are very typically and statistically confirmed moments where myopia starts. Yeah? So there is a change, uh, probably sudden, unexpected sometimes, sometimes expected, sometimes even wanted, but there is a change that the person lives with fear or insecurity. Mm -hmm. And when a person develops myopia, when there's this fear and insecurity and the person 
uh, removes herself from the world uh, that she sees or he sees as threatening, uh, usually as a compensation for the fear or in the insecurity, the person becomes much more organized and uh, controlling. If A happens, I will do one. If B happens, I will do two. If C happens, I will do three. And then if uh, Z happens, I will do 28. So they are thinking about 100,000 possible negative futures and all kinds of plans of what they will do if the different negative options will happen. And that's a lot of mental activity, much more than necessary, because there's only one future and it doesn't even have to be negative. So there's an excess of mental activity and planning and organizing and uh, doing things too in advance, being preoccupied and things like that. So for a person to release myopia, it's important um, to consider that things are okay, that everything's going to be okay, that I will have the ability to um, handle whatever situation life presents me. So trust in ourselves and trust in life and trust in life processes and also to focus on the present moment. Leave the future to the future and just be present in the present. If things are present, they are relevant. If they are not yet present, it's not now it's not the moment to handle them. It's too soon, so we leave it for the future, yeah? So when we do these things, it's, um, then we relax and then the myopia can go away, okay? Now, some people ask me, what tools can I use um, to release all these eye symptoms? And um, I'm going to give you something general, although there are, there are indeed many, 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 many tools and in the clear sight method in the, in the advanced program, we show a number of them, but there is one thing that will work every time, and that is once you remember the moment where the eye symptom started, <clears throat> the moment where you freezed the emotion, go back to that moment and allow yourself to experience the emotion that was not felt, because that's the whole point for emotions, to be felt, to be experienced. And if you don't want, you don't need to do a show in front of people or something. I mean, you can be on your own. And if somebody died and you never allowed yourself to cry, well, take the time to, to feel the, the sorrow and to cry. And it's okay. Or if you were angry against your boss and you couldn't express it to the boss because you could lose your job, well, you can be in your own space and hit the cushion or something and let, let the emotion release, yeah? So... One possibility is to go back to the moment where you felt those emotions, remember what the situation was, and let yourself see what happens with you and those emotions. And crying is fine. Our eyes have two functions, crying and seeing. Uh -huh. Where do we cry? With our eyes. So if we uh, repress our eyes from crying, we make it difficult for our eyes to function well because it's the same organ. Either you let it live its own life and do what it has to do, or you don't. And if you keep yourself from crying, you also keep yourself from seeing. Yeah, so this is, this is an important thing. Okay, so we talked about myopia, and maybe people who have experienced myopia, you could share in the chat, uh, if it makes sense, if it rings bells, yeah? Um, okay. So this is for uh, myopia. So myopia is when the uh, um, oblique muscles that are too tense and they make the eye permanently too long. So that allows us to focus near but not far. And with hyperopia, it's the opposite. Uh -huh. It's the straight muscles that are tense and they make the eye flat. Um, so what happens with hyperopia? Actually with hyperopia, the emotion is also fear. Mm -hmm. But the mechanism of, uh, of um, compensation is different. In myopia, people freeze and hide and look at the distance, the world. They put the world at the distance. With hyperopia, um, um, these people that feel insecure or not safe, they run away. That's one of the other uh, escape uh, like mechanisms when we feel in danger. There's like you hide, you escape, or you fight, right? So with hyperopia, the, uh, adapt, the adaptive response is to run away. Uh -huh. So people with hyperopia 
um, are like, um, uh, they seem a bit more anxious and they seem to have uh, less of a possibility or ease to stay where they are, to engage long term into being in a place or a profession or in relationships. They're like looking for the escape, uh, the exit, the, um, how would you say that, the, the emergency exit. Where's the emergency exit of different situations, yeah? So also for hyperopia, it's important to realize that whatever made you feel that you had to escape to be safe probably is long ago in the past and that you are now in a safe place as an adult. You have other resources and you are safe and you can make things safe for yourself. So you have the right to stay where you are. You can engage, you can be comfortable. You have the right to do that, yeah? Sometimes with hyperopia, there's a touch of anger as well. So it's interesting to see uh, what it is and release it as well. And uh, with presbyopia, the experience of seeing is the opposite than with myopia. With presbyopia, we have um, the syndrome of the arm is too short because we have to put things far away in order to see them well. Yeah. So what are we doing with our energy? We're giving it far away. Uh -huh. We're giving it away. We see things that are far away, but we don't see things that are near. So metaphorically, we are giving our energy away. And why does this happen? Presbyopia, or the need for reading glasses, is something we are told that happens with age. Now, it's very interesting to know that uh, this, this, this that is statistically frequent in a lot of places is not universal. About 20 years ago, there was almost no presbyopia in China. And it's interesting that China used and still is uh, a country that where people are, are, have very long lives. Uh -huh. So how come that in China, where people get very old, they didn't need reading glasses, they didn't develop presbyopia? Well, uh, if we're talking about what happens with our consciousness and the psychological effects, these things sometimes are also societal, yeah? And it depends on the norms of uh, each place. And so presbyopia happens in societies or social environments where older people are not considered useful anymore. Yeah, for example, they retire and they cannot do the jobs that they like so much, or they don't give you a loan anymore to buy the house that you want, yeah? Or, uh, or, for example, sometimes it's personal, you don't, you don't feel as beautiful as uh, you were before, or sometimes you see that your grandkids are using all the technology uh, without even looking at it and you're there trying to figure out how things work, or sometimes you already married or you didn't, or you divorced, or you had kids or you didn't, uh, but it looks like all the important things already happened and you're kind of out of date. So if that happens, you feel like you're not important anymore. So if you're not the star of your own film, if you're not the main character, the protagonist, then you're giving your energy away to everyone else. The ones that feel that you feel that they are the stars now. So you give your energy to your children or your grandchildren or your partner or your parents or your neighbors or the children in Africa or something else or the environment. But but you're giving away your energy to those that seem the important characters of the film at this moment, yeah? Um, now, what happened in China uh, so that people being very old didn't have presbyopia? Well, they have this uh, Confucianist philosophy in which uh, older people are regarded as the wise and expert to whom we go very, um, respectfully and in admiration to ask for advice for life. And older people always have the best place to sit and they are served the first. So they're treated as precious, which is very different experience from what I just described, yeah? So in this case, people do not uh, develop presbyopia because they still feel like they are a star in the film, yeah? So this is giving us very interesting clues on what to do to release the presbyopia, yeah? And uh, we could say a couple of them. So first, if you're in this stage of life with lots of things already happened and are behind you, uh, your kids are already grown up so you don't have to take care of them and uh, you had a job and now you stopped, 
well, maybe it's the perfect time to do all those things that you always wanted to do and you never had the time. For example, go traveling or start painting or dancing or whatever, because every person has different things that they like. Some people like hiking and taking care of, of plants and others like cooking and others like spending time with friends, whatever. This is the perfect moment to do all those things that for many, many years you had to leave on the side. So now you have time to do them. Go ahead and do them. And because you are so important and you're the star of your own film, do those things that are completely useless for everyone else or anyone else first. Because in this way you are saying to yourself, I am so important that I deserve to have this time just for me, that is going to be completely useless for everyone else, but because I'm important. And so you start giving to yourself attention, uh -huh, energy, back to yourself, back to you. So. There's this saying that I love in English that applies to release presbyopia and it, and it is let the rest of your life be the best of your life or make the rest of your life be the best of your life. And for this also and to rebalance the, how the energy has been flowing, you also have to apply positive selfishness. Yeah, there's a, there's a saying in Spanish for positive selfishness that is very clear. I'm going to try to translate and see if it works. So how does this work? Well, first, me. After that, me. In any case, afterwards, I. And if there's anything left, it is for me. Yeah? And it may feel maybe exaggerated and very skewed, but it's on purpose because people who have developed presbyopia have been giving so much away to others that now it's the time to make the balance by focusing on giving to themselves and giving to themselves. And in this way, you bring energy back to you. You give yourself more time, uh -huh, more kindness, more patience, more love, more compassion for yourself. And this is the way to relax the muscles that are necessary to relax so that you can get rid of presbyopia, yeah? Okay, so, so we've talked about myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, and now astigmatism. With astigmatism, it's the straight muscles that have irregular tensions, and they create a shape for the cornea, like a rugby or an American football ball, instead of having the shape of a soccer or a basketball ball, yeah? They're not round, they're, the, the cornea is distorted, so it makes the lines distorted. So what, what um, it creates with vision is confusion, and psychologically what is associated is confusion. But what kind of confusion? What um, about your own values? What is really true for you? Yeah? And here I'm, I'm not talking about solidarity, equality, freedom, or liberty. It's more what is true for you? What makes your heart sing? What is, yeah, what, is, what makes you happy? And a lot of people betray themselves in what is real and true for them in order to receive approval or to conform to the expectations that other people have about them. And the expectations may come from parents or they may come from the family or they may come from societal norms and rules about how women should be or how men should be or how daughters or sons should behave or how parents should behave or how people in such a professional role should behave. Uh, but in any case, the person has become apart from what is real for herself or himself. And while I'm talking about all these symptoms, you may remember that I had lots of them. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm talking about it and do not feel ashamed or guilty or anything. I mean, you did your best like I did my best and now we're finding keys so we can do better, yeah? I had myopia. I had astigmatism, I had presbyopia, I didn't have hyperopia, but I have diplopia and strabismus and amblyopia, so, and we're talking, we'll talk about them as well. So uh, we can have these kinds of tensions, but we can also release them. So in my case, I did have astigmatism for a while, and when I looked at my own life, for example, I realized, at the time when I had astigmatism appear, I realized that I was not living my dream. I was living my father's dream. My father wanted to be a university professor. 
he did a PhD, and then, well, for whatever reasons of the Spain of the time, and there were political tensions, and anyway, uh, he didn't get the job at the university for reasons that were not directly linked to his research capacity and his excellence in science. Uh -huh. And he always dreamt of having a daughter that would be a scientist, that would be an excellent uh, yeah, professor in the academic realm. So I was living my father's dream. I wasn't living my own. So I was being the good daughter, but I was not being happy, even though I got prizes for my PhD and I was at the editorial board of an international uh, scientific journal and I got prizes. I, I got lots of recognition for my academic career. But I was bored with it. At some point in time, it didn't interest me anymore just to publish journal, uh, articles in journals that a few people very specialized would read, but that wouldn't help the world in any way. So I had to have a very serious conversation with myself and, and recognize that I wasn't living my, my life, my dream, and what made my heart sing and makes my heart sing. Yeah, science and research is very important and it's useful, but what makes me happy is to put this information and these tools at the service of people so that it makes people's lives better. <laughs> that sounds a lot more fun to see people uh, have uh, yeah, more health, better eyesight, uh, better vision, better quality of life. That makes me really happy and my heart sing. So when I had the stigmatism, I really had to change the steering wheel of my uh, trajectory, my career, and be less interested about or put less attention on uh, certain aspects of uh, the academic life and more into what we could call, well, at the university we call this um, um, integrative experiential clinical sociology, which sounds very like big words. Well, we could call this also coaching or uh, having a therapeutical path with teaching. Um, so this is what I'm doing now. I'm putting, taking together all the research and putting it together in a method that is step by step, that is clear and is very easy, so that people can use this information and transform their lives, transform their eyesight, transform their vision, and be much happier. That makes sense to me. <laughs> so I needed to do this, and at the time it seemed like a challenge to change the course of what I was doing in, in my job, and I had to go to some, through some conversations that were not so pleasant with my dad, etc., so that I could see clearly again. So if you have been experiencing astigmatism at some point in time, you may ask yourself, when did you betray yourself? Who were you trying to please and why? And would it be important to please yourself? And uh, maybe if you have a way of being that is not appreciated in one social environment, well, the good news is that you're not a tree, so you can change the social environment and go somewhere where you will be appreciated, uh -huh. where as you are, you don't have to change the way you are, but you can surround yourself by people who will appreciate who you are. Yeah, isn't that more interesting? And fortunately, there's lots of, yeah, environments and uh, social um, groups of all kinds, uh, where all kinds of people are appreciated. No wonder, no, no matter how specific you are, you can find people who will like those specificities. And nowadays it's easier and easier because through the internet you can find all the other people who like the very same specific things as you like. I, I know someone uh, that is absolutely fascinating, fascinated about uh, sewing historical dresses from the 18th century and who's always dressed in uh, 18th century clothes. Well, she has found hundreds of people from all around the world that love that, and she can live her dream. Well, whatever it is that you like doing, be sure that you'll find other people who appreciate that. But you have to allow yourself uh, to live your truth, uh -huh, to live your dream. And that's what corrects uh, astigmatism. So now you will be understanding that really your eyes are guiding you to your happiness are guiding you to your well-being, to your health. Because whenever you release all the tensions that allow you to see better, you're making choices that are also allowing you to be happier. Yeah? Okay, so we talked about myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, astigmatism. Let's see, Anna, could you tell me, uh, maybe are there questions about specific symptoms so that we start there? Because I have a list, but uh, 
but if we can reply to what people want more first, then it's better. You can put your mic on. Nystagmus. Uh, Someone has asked about this nystagmus. Yes, I saw it in the list. It's a pretty rare symptom. It's not that common. But when people have nystagmus, uh, their eyes are moving very fast, so fast that it's too fast for the brain to actually keep track of uh, the memory of what has been seen, so the image is not stable. Yeah? And usually it's uh, related with very high levels of anxiety, nervousness, uh -huh, insecurity. Mm -hmm. So it's even more so important to relax and uh, to find um, good reasons to know um, that uh, you are safe and that you are okay, that things are okay and they're going to be okay. Yeah? So, yeah, this would be it. So, going into more common symptoms, I see that someone is asking about amblyopia. And amblyopia, or having a lazy eye, very often is paired with strabismus. So, we're going to talk about those two. I've had them both also. <laughs> and uh, these appear also often in childhood. So, we'll start with strabismus. So, with strabismus... <laughs> Let's see if I can... Okay, I'm, I'm running out of, <laughs> of eyeballs. Sorry about that. Oh my God, well, I'll do it without then. <laughs> this is a bit dangerous otherwise. Okay, I was going to show like two balls looking like this or like that, but anyway, let's not do that. I'll have to buy some more. So with strabismus, so you can have convergent strabismus, a convergence squint. I can do that one, but I cannot do the divergent one. That's why I wanted my, uh, my uh, little... Okay, this one's resisting. <laughs> not, not anymore. <laughs> anyway, it's okay, I don't have any more. I'll have to buy some. Okay, so with um, strabismus, if it's convergent strabismus, like this, uh -huh, um, each eye actually is connected more with one of the brain hemispheres, okay? Um, and uh, we can also find them um, a personality. For people who are right-handed, a right eye is connected um, um, to the young aspects, um, action, projects, going to the outside, uh -huh. And because these kinds of uh, qualities have more often traditionally been associated with uh, the male or the masculine and men, then this eye often reflects a relationship uh, to, um, to men, important men in our lives. And it can be our dad, a brother, uh, a, a male partner or a son or a male friend or a male figure that's important in our life. And our left eye, reflects more uh, the relationship that we have with emotions, intuition, reception. And because these qualities have more often traditionally been associated with uh, feminine and females and women, then the left eye can also reflect our relationship with an important woman in our life. It can be mom, it can be a sister, it can be a daughter, it can be um, a close female friend, or an important female figure in our life, a boss or something like that. So when there is strabismus or a squint and the eyes are converging, usually it reflects the perception that the kid has on the relationship between mom and dad. Yeah, they're not working together, they're not coordinated, they're not talking to each other. But with converging strabismus, at the same time, the eyes are pointing the kid itself. So it's as if the child feels guilty because the parents are not talking to each other, not communicating well, or not coordinating well. So in this case, it's important for the child, uh, but you can talk to the child, and uh, help the child understand that whatever's happening between mom and dad, it's not his fault or her fault, yeah? And also, uh, we, I need to say that every couple is a circus, every couple functions different, and sometimes Outwards, the couple seems dysfunctional, but in the intimacy, they're really actually getting along very well and everything's fine. So the perception of the child may not be the same experience between mom and dad, actually. But 
In any case, it talks about the perception that the child has. Uh -huh. And when the eyes are diverging, it also means to the child um, that mom and dad are not talking to each other, they're not coordinated, they're not working together, and the impression the child has is that he or she has to choose. If I can connect with dad, then I cannot connect with mom, and if I connect with mom, I, then I cannot connect with dad, as if they would have to choose camps or choose loyalties, because they seem to be so antagonist, mom and dad, so different, that the child cannot be connected to both at the same time. So again, once uh, there's some understanding uh, that in any case, mom and dad got together uh, so that the child could exist and that that was a collaboration out of love, uh, it makes it so much easier for those eyes to be coordinated again and to uh, function well. And well, I mentioned for right-handed people, I should also mention for left-handed people, it's the opposite. For left-handed people, the left hand is the <clears throat> and the left eye are the, the ones that are expressing action and projects and going outwards and, the, and because these qualities are associated with um, male, um, well, they reflect the relationship with an important man in our life, um, a dad, a brother, a son, uh, a good friend, a male good friend, or um, a male important figure, it could be a teacher, a boss, or a, someone that's important, that's relevant. And for left-handed people, the right eye is associated with uh, emotions, uh, intuition, receiving, and because these things are associated more with female qualities, they could reflect also the relationship with an important woman in life. So mom, a sister, a daughter, uh -huh, a good uh, female friend, or an important figure, in, uh, in the in a female figure in this person's life. So with amblyopia, we can take this understanding of the polarities of the eyes and see which one is the eye that is not seeing well. Which one is the eye that the brain is not considering? Is it the young male eye towards action and projects or is it the yin female eye more towards emotions, intuition and, uh, and the intimacy and the reception? So once we know which eye has the symptom, we can see if this person is experiencing tension with um, stepping into action and having projects or experiencing tension with an important man. Mm -hmm. Or if the person is experiencing tension to feel her own emotions and be in contact, be in touch with her own intuition and accept the messages from intuition, or if she has tension with an important female in her life. Again, when you're looking at the meaning of symptoms, you should go and remember the moment in your life when the symptom appeared. And that's, when the mo what, that's the moment where there was some stressful situation that probably involved these uh, elements that I'm talking about. Okay, so we have talked about the four refractive errors, amblyopia, strabismus, Let's talk about some other common symptoms like um, uh, crying eyes or dry eyes. Okay? Uh, liquids in the body uh, usually are a metaphor of emotions and we said that our eyes are made for seeing and for crying. So when there's dry eye or a crying eye, usually it's a reflection of sadness that has been uh, blocked or held. Uh -huh. So go back to the moment in your life when the dry eye or the crying eye started and realize if it was a moment where you didn't allow yourself to cry for something that was sad. You probably had good reasons, but it's in the past, so maybe now you can cry the things that you didn't cry. And if you do, then your eye will also regulate. Of course, now we're looking at things from the emotional angle, but we also know that there's many other tools that we can use and that are also going to help, like blinking or yawning or laughing will also help you uh, to have uh, better tears, yes? Um, but again, we'll keep talking about this emotional level. Now, something that can happen too is that you can get conjunctivitis or itching eyes, and you can even develop pterygium, uh, a tissue of uh, inflammated tissue in the eye. So this is like a spectrum of the same thing. Every time that there's something itching or inflammated in your body, and if it becomes even a tissue, then it's even more so, we're talking about anger, suppressed anger. If you get conjunctivitis, and 
you, your eyes are red and itching for two, three days, well, probably it was something just that happened at a very specific moment. You were angry about something and then it went away. But if you have itching eyes all the time, well, then there's something that's nagging you that you're angry about and it's there all the time and you haven't solved it yet. So maybe it would, it would be good to identify what it is and to have some conversation or place some limits uh, to the thing so that you don't have to feel angry anymore or leave the situation that makes you angry. But there, you need to do something about it. And when there is perigium, usually it's about a perception of social injustice uh, or social inequality, something that's structural in life or in society that makes you angry but that you see more difficultly how you could change that. Yeah. I see, for example, in Mexico, and I love Mexico, I'm in Mexico at the time, I really adore Mexico, uh, there's a lot more people having perigium than in Spain, for example, and when I look at society, the Mexican society, the Spanish society, there's a lot more uh, structural inequality in Mexico, or a lot more differences between men and women, and uh, I could understand why a lot of people could see this and feel the injustice and develop terigium. So if you're seeing things that feel very unfair to you, maybe you can get involved in social movements to change that, and then you're doing something with it, and then you don't have to have the thing in your eyes. Yeah. Um, more, there's also, for example, floaters, or um, floaters, lots of people have floaters. First thing to know is that floaters are a normal, um, uh, element in the process of um, cell renewal in the vitreous humor. It's normal to have floaters. Everyone has floaters. And you can see them when you look at the sky or at water or a white wall, and that's normal. What is not normal is to have so many floaters that it becomes bothering to see. So in Spanish, we call the floaters flying uh, flies. Yeah. They're like insects that are bothering, uh, or they look like little worms. So you could see what are the worms or the flies, the insects, that are bugging you in your life, what things are bothering you or worrying you. Uh -huh. And when you solve that, the floaters tend to go away. And we also know that floaters go away, relaxing the eyes and looking at the eyes, uh, and looking at the floaters and their movement, etc. Um, so, and when there is um, f uh, f um, photophobia or sensitivity to light um, and photopsies could be related to that, Teresa, I ask you, I see your question. Um, our relationship with the sun and with light um, talks about a relationship with power, personal power. The sun is a very powerful uh, element, yeah? Uh, we talk, when we, people who are familiar with chakras or Chinese medicine or things like that, we talk about the solar plexus. Mm -hmm. So and this is the part of our body that also uh, shows our relationship with power, with our capacity of action. It, it's a certainty if I want something, I can, I can get it. Maybe it will take me time or it will take me learning, but I have the certainty that I can do it. Yeah? So when people have sensitivity to light or the sunlight, things like that, we have to ask ourselves what's the relationship with their own personal power. Do they feel powerful enough to achieve the things that they want or to just express themselves as they are, as a star, as a shining star? Or do they feel that they should hide or transform themselves or show themselves different? And so when people have this difficult relationship with their own inner power, they sometimes are also bothered by people who are showing themselves as they are. Yeah, so um, it could be that you are not okay with your own power or that you feel bothered by a person that is displaying a lot of power. So when you clarify that relationship, then the uh, photophobia goes away. And of course, if you do sunning and these other things, of course, uh, that will help a lot. Yeah. But we're, again, we're talking about this angle of emotions. Um, let's see, uh, I see also lots of people have asked questions about glaucoma and cataracts, am I right, Anna? Um, so yeah, let me know, is there more symptoms besides those two? Well, we'll get into those. Um, and uh, if any of you want to share about your personal journey with emotions and how they helped to release those symptoms, it will be really, really very nice to listen to you as well. 
So um, with glaucoma, glaucoma is caused by um, an excess of um, uh, intraocular pressure. The aqueous humor is um, created too fast, not eliminated fast enough. Um, and of course, we saw how sunning and palming and sandwiches with palming and sunning are really, really good uh -huh, uh, if you have glaucoma. But in terms of uh, the emotional experience, for people who have glaucoma, they're looking at life with too much pressure. That's what an excess of intraocular pressure is talking about, too much pressure. And usually this um, excess of pressure comes from a feeling of responsibility in a personal relationship, in the family, for example. Something's going on and you feel too responsible for it and you feel too much pressure about it. So it's important to release the pressure, to relax. Everything that we can do to relax uh, physically, but also inside, will help with glaucoma. Yeah? So uh, lower the, the, the stress levels and the pressure levels. Really, don't take on your shoulders things that don't belong to you. Mm -hmm. You're carrying too much on your shoulders. With cataracts, um, um, with cataracts, what happens is that the crystalline becomes opaque. On the one hand, at a physical level, we know that the crystalline tends to become opaque. The, the fibers change uh, from being transparent into translucid and then opaque when the crystalline is not moving enough. So nice to see you playing. <laughs> Somebody in the Zoom room is playing the guitar. This is cool. <laughs> Yay, this is good against astigmatism. Show yourself as you are. <laughs> Very good, we'll do what you like. So with cataracts, what happens is that the person uh, has lost interest in life. It's as if uh, you're closing the windows, yeah? Um, I, I was saying the crystalline becomes opaque uh, when you're not moving it enough. And how do you move the crystalline? Well, looking far and near and far and near and playing with things that change focus. But in terms of personal experience and emotions, people develop cataracts when they lose what was making them happy to get up in the morning and go out and see the world, yeah? And a few typical uh, situations that are associated with generating cataracts is, for example, people who loved a lot their job and they really had fun going every morning to do what they did and then they retire. So now they don't have something to look forward to every morning. Uh -huh. That's one thing. Um, another one, and this one is more typical for women, some women who were looking forward to having grandchildren and enjoying the role, the much more fun and relaxed role of being a grandmother, to play with the kids but not be responsible for them. Um, and then their children don't have kids. Or their children have kids but they live very, very far away. Or they uh, live nearby or far away but there is some conflict with the kids or the partner of the kids and they don't get to see the, kid, the grandchildren anyway. And I see Luhan that's saying yes, so I guess this uh, rings a bell if you want to share something about it. So when you manage to solve this thing or to find another thing that makes you very happy, the cataracts can go away. And for men, another typical thing is certain men who are very, very um, attached and that like their sexuality a lot. Uh, and uh, when they get older, there's problems with the prostate or something. And then sexuality is not so much fun anymore. Well, if that was a drive, a motivation in life, and they don't have it anymore, well, life gets boring, and that's another moment to develop cataracts. Uh, when, but these are just examples. Maybe for you it's something else, but you have to see what was the thing that you were so looking forward to that you don't have anymore, so life looks boring, and then you close the windows. You, you want to say something about cataracts? Because you were saying yes, yes. Um, if you want to put the mic on uh, Luhan, you can share a little bit. And then we'll, got into, we'll go into a few more symptoms. Can you put the mic on? There you are. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, I, it was a really uh, ring a bell because okay. my mother is experienced uh, cataracts because um, I am one of the three. Uh, she has three children. Children. Uh, uh -huh. And I'm the only one who have uh, children. Yeah, and your mother lives in Uruguay and you live in Portugal. Yes. My mother yes. is yes. in Uruguay and she developed cataracts because of it, because she, all, she was always at home with my kids. 
and then suddenly <laughs> she was alone mm -hmm. uh, and we when we are here so that's why uh, that part of the cataracts it's uh, I, there's still uh, a little bit and but I'm actually help her I'm helping her with uh, with that symptom and uh, for now she she is doing well because there is no necessary to do any surgery okay and, and you helped me a lot with it with your clear side method so it's, okay. it's wonderful it's wonderful great well thank you for sharing because uh, well and if some others want to share when real uh, well, uh, bells were ringing <laughs> <laughs> Um, then it's probably useful also for other people if you want to share. And um, if anybody else wants to share something, let me know. Uh, Anna, otherwise I'll continue. And Petra, okay, let's hear Petra and then Anna. So what, what made sense to you or what experience you had? Well, I just want to underline that maybe, you know, you're talking about all these emotions and sometimes, you know, we're we don't want to look at it. We don't want to drop, go there. We rather do it some palming or certainly because it feels safe. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to, yeah, just um, emphasize that this clear side, clear side method course really, I mean, you take us, you take us by the hand and you give us so many uh, perspectives to go into the emotions because everybody is so different. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing, you know, for everybody or something. And um, yeah, so you make it quite easy. It doesn't you make it like, oh, so now we're going into this physical uh, psych psychology, psychological, <laughs> help me out here. Anyway, uh, psychic, different. Uh, um, Emotional things. In, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So there's a lot of options between different levels and voila. even within the emotional level there's many different tools some will work for certain people and some will work from other people and so what Petra is talking about um, you are experiencing now the wake up your eyes free course um, and of course you can uh, use it share it and again if you haven't registered yet uh, for the wake up your eyes free course um, I think the team could still put the link available so you can do that, do that and you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel where we're going to share lots of free material. Um, but Petra is talking about the ClearSight method, the ClearSight advanced program that we're actually going to release um, tomorrow. We're going to open registration for a few days for people who want to go for a more in-depth process. Um, now we're for a couple of weeks uh, sharing a lot of information and with the clear sight method, um, those who want, who want to go deeper, because a lot of people are already solving their vision problems just with the free uh, classes and we love that. We do this because we love sharing all of this and uh, we hope for as many people as possible to see clearly um, with their own eyes. Now there's some people that may want to have more in-depth uh, coaching and support and more tools and more information. And for those people to borrow, when I will release video number four, and in video number four, we're going to talk about six levels for improving eyesight. We'll talk about how you can do it at the physical level with relaxation and exercises at the chemical level, improving uh, how you eat to see better at the emotional level. We're talking about this now at the mental level, because your brain is the main organ for vision. Your eyes are the cameras capturing uh, signals and light, but it's your brain that allows you to see and you can also train your brain to see better. We have already talked about a light and energy, but we'll go uh, more into that tomorrow. And you can also um, improve your habits to see better. It takes you as much time uh, to look in a poor way, to use your eyes poorly and see worse and worse or to use your eyes correctly, take care of them and see better and better. And you can put them into in autopilot with good habits so that your vision improvement uh, happens on its own once you in, uh, incorporate those habits. So we'll talk about those six levels. Tomorrow you'll have the information and we may have some extra classes with exercises, but for those people who want uh, the coaching and the support and to have the full method, we're going to open registration tomorrow. Uh -huh. So when we release video number four, uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. at your local time, you'll have access to this video. You can also 
uh, start registering if that is your wish so that we can help you even further because there's so much we can do with the free classes um, and we're doing every time we do more um, but uh, yeah uh, if you want really support um, personalized and much more closer you may want to consider the possibility of registering to the clear site uh, method and um, I think Anna you also wanted to say something about symptoms and emotions yes the most important thing is all this information you are giving us, all those resources are available to empower ourselves. Absolutely. We are not any more victims. We yeah. create our, our lives. We are responsible. There's always something we can do. And also we can choose among all these levels, all those resources. And another thing is Every time there are more cases among young people of cataracts. Yeah. For example, that's mm -hmm. bad news. Yeah. Mm. We really so, need that kind of information. Ab absolutely, absolutely. I think for young people, they need to be aware that it's useful not to be just looking at the same distance all the time, uh, on the one hand, at the physical level, but also at the emotional level. It's a question of what would make them really happy and what future they can imagine for themselves. And if we see that we've been almost for two years locked at home, I mean, how boring may that be for young teenagers? I mean, for us adults, it hasn't been fun, but for kids or teenagers, if that's the life that they were going to see, I could imagine that there's been a spike of cataracts uh, for younger people at this moment. It makes sense. Yeah, but as you say, information is power. When we have more information, we have more power. We can uh, transform our, our, our experience a lot. So thank you, thank you, Anna. And speaking of information, I also wanted to talk about a few more symptoms that are also common. And I see that there's a few questions that I also will take some time to answer to those. So detachments, when there is retinal detachment or vitreous detachment, well, if such thing happens, and this is one of the rare cases where it's really justified to have surgery, and actually it's not just justified, but it's advised, if you have a retinal or a vitreous detachment, go run and have it anchored, because otherwise you risk becoming blind. Uh, if you lose your, the retina detaches from your optic nerve, then there's no more communication between the brain and the eye. So that's really important. But beyond that, um, Beyond that, oh, they're telling me we have 52 people uh, on YouTube. Yoo-hoo, in, in person, that's great. So if uh, a retinal detachment happens, we can also look at, uh, so if you get the surgery, you'll have to wait for a month, uh, and then you can practice all the natural vision improvement things, yeah? But in terms of emotions, uh, with retinal or vitreous detachment, what happens is that there has been a relational detachment. So there's been a loss of somebody that was very important. And the loss may be because the person died or maybe there was a conflict and the, uh, we don't get along anymore and so the relationship is broken or because this person, again, lives far away so we, have, we feel like we have lost them. So when these things happen, it's really important to go through the grieving process. And there's stages for grieving. You have uh, really very, very beautiful and useful uh, books on grieving for losses that can be helpful to see how to deal with the emotions and the process of grieving. Um, now, I, there's this Swiss doctor that has written amazing books about this. It's a bit of topic, but let me see. Um, Uh, La mort est un nouveau soleil. Uh, Elisabeth Kubler-Ross. She has amazingly beautiful models on how to handle loss and grief and things like that. Um, so it's very important if you have a retinal or vitreous detachment that you have felt a loss that's unbearable and maybe you need some support to uh, learn how to handle it. Yeah. Um, and let me see, uh, macular degeneration, that's also very common, macular degeneration. When macular degeneration happens, we lose um, the uh, center, the most, um, the highest quality of vision in the center of our eyesight. So the question here is, if you have lost 
the thing that was more central in your life because you lose the center of your vision. So you have lost your central motivation, something has happened. So you need to find again something that is central in your life. Yeah? And of course with macular degeneration also the sunning is very important and looking at the sunset and the sunrise and all the other things we talked about and more that we'll talk. But in terms of emotional experience, uh, you have lost the center of your life. So you need to take care of finding again something that's centrally motivating for you. And with glaucoma and with some other uh, retinitis and retinosis, it's the opposite that happens. You lose the periphery. You see in the center, but you lose the periphery. So in this case, you're going too fast. You need to slow down and smell the flowers. Look at the context. Look at what's going around. Not just focus on one thing, but be aware of the rest, things, of, the rest of the things happening in life that you can enjoy. Yeah? No, don't become a unidimensional person that's only thinking about one thing. Yeah? Uh, take um, a breath and enjoy the beauty of life. Yeah? So that's very important. And uh, I have seen uh, that Anna has come. You've met Anna um, at some other moment in the first life, I believe. And Anna uh, was uh, able to release keratoconus. We sometimes have questions about keratoconus also. With keratoconus, the cornea, that is the strongest lens in the eye, it has, uh, is, it's the most powerful lens in the eye, it has between 32 to 42 diopters, naturally. Um, the, a diopter is a measure of the power of a lens, yeah? So diopter is not something bad or good, it's just a measure of the power of a lens. And when you're told that you have so many diopters, it's actually not you but the glasses that they give you, the lenses have that number of diopters, yeah? And now the cornea is a natural lens and the crystalline is a natural lens and they also have diopters, yeah? Because they have a power. So the cornea is the most powerful lens, so it's also a metaphorical, it's a metaphor of your relationship with power. And when you get keratoconus and your cornea is becoming too um, uh, pointed and it risks to break, it, it could be a very painful thing and uh, it is a reflection of how painful it is to feel that you have lost your personal power. Uh -huh, that's what's behind Keratoconus. Anna, do you want to share something? Uh, I see that you put your camera on, so if you want to take uh, the possibility to speak, if you want to take the mic, it's possible. I know that your English is a bit difficult, you're very, very fluid, uh, when you speak in Spanish you're uh, extremely good and in English you, find your, you try to find your way to say things, to express yourself, but if you want to say something, go ahead, because I know you, you uh, got rid of Keratoconus, no, not this time, or oh, it's not working for the mic, sorry, my mistake, um, go ahead, try now. There. Hi. <laughs> you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now it's working. So if you want to share something about your process, uh, about, uh, yeah, uh, the emotional aspects of symptoms and how having the keys about what's the emotional meaning of every symptom is a very powerful tool to improve your eyesight, your vision. Maybe you can say something or maybe specifically about keratoconus, whatever you like. Uh, yes. I think the uh, uh, emotional situation could be sometimes uh, hard to control because the life or um, maybe the war or the situation in the in the life of uh, each person is different. In my case, I I can tell to you that always living um, in a hard life where the emotions I was always jumping in different um, different in different ways uh, so when I start having keratoconus yeah uh, I, I never I never know how painful it could be and when you talk about emotions that is true because uh, sometimes uh, in my case, I think that I always trying to fix the war 
by all another persons. Uh, I never, 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 never take care about me. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think that I maybe left my own person in a second mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. and always was working by the perfection, by the all about another people, never uh -huh. me. Um, yeah. Can I was a, yeah. A wake-up call. <laughs> it was a wake-up call to get Keratokono so that you would take care of yourself and put yourself first. Yeah, yeah. And congratulations yeah. because you've been able to do it and you, you got rid of the Keratokonos mm -hmm. and you see so much, 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 much better than when we first met. So thank you. Um, I'm going to take the time uh, to um, see now. I don't know if you, you wanted to say more things because I saw that you were getting up, so I assumed that you had finished. But if you want to come back, you're very welcome, or other people in the Zoom room. See, otherwise, I see that there's a few questions, so let me answer to some of them. I see Dr. Ebru, uh, sorry, I may not be able to pronounce your last name correctly. You say Turk or something like that is asking what about tunnel vision? Okay, with tunnel vision, uh, it's what we were talking about. If you just see uh, the center, but you do not see what's around uh, in terms of uh, the emotional experience, what has happened is that you're too focused on one thing. You're like, you've become unidimensional and you're not taking time to go slow, enjoy the flowers, enjoy the context, pay attention of other things happening in life. Uh -huh. So it would be a good thing uh, to do so. Oh, there's some more comments. Sonia Minen, I started a few days ago with your exercises. It'll be an extremely long way, but I have to admit that there is quite a little improvement. No more tired eyes, no more trouble for screen sight. Great, Sonia, congratulations. And keep persevering, you'll see that uh, the improvements will stack on each other and you'll see better and better. And no improvement is little, actually, because every improvement, even if it's little, uh, it improves your eyesight and it improves your quality of life. So they all deserve being acknowledged and celebrated, just as you did. Congratulations. And Stani Moivery says, effective exercises, just the use of palming helps me to rest my eyes for another quite hour of work since I'm working with computers, great. Thank you all the way from Haiti. Uh, okay, well, congratulations, uh, Stani. And yeah, palming is a great pause uh, to do when you're working at the computer every hour or so, uh, maybe even more frequent if you can, and it will give a very good rest for your eyes. And there's a question by Miss London. My astigmatism is getting worse and worse. I feel like it's connected with not achieving the high expectations that my father expected of me. He thought I would be a real high flyer. Well, Miss London, that makes complete sense and it was what I was talking about. Um, but what would be important is that you detach yourself from whatever your, the expectations of your father are. The person that you have to make happy is not your father, but yourself. And he may never approve of it. And you have to learn to be okay with it because it's your life. Your father had his to live and to choose whatever he wanted to do with it. And now you have yours and it's your to choose what you want to do with it. Yeah. And sometimes it requires a little bit of inner work to do that releasing. Yeah. Sometimes talking with the father or the parents is useful, but sometimes it's also not possible because they are really stuck in their own beliefs. But you have to be okay with yourself and, and your own life. That's, that's what's most important. Yeah? And again, if you notice, uh, our eyes are showing us the way for our own happiness. They are like a GPS. When we know, um, when we know what's the meaning of each uh, symptom, and what's the metaphor hiding behind, and we can look at it uh, carefully and explore it with it and take the hypothesis seriously and do some fine-tuning inside. Well, when we release the tension that was causing the vision problem, it means that we've released the tension in our lives as well. So not only we see better, but we're much, much happier. So my encouragement and invitation for you is that, well, this has been recorded, so you can watch it again. You can again also watch video number three 
of the Wake Up Your Eye as free course. And if you have not registered, you have the link so you can register and watch the whole sequence because there's an order. There's a, a really uh, thought of order of each video after the other one. You can still share it um, this weekend with your family. You can organize a watch party to watch the three videos. You can also watch the three lives in YouTube so that you can make sense of all this information and integrate it and use it for your own benefit, for your own eyesight and your own life. And again, if you're interested in going further and you want support, tomorrow we're releasing video number four, where you will learn six different levels that you can use to improve your eyesight, to see better and better. And uh, so there's a lot of useful information you can still get. And there'll be more exercises coming along with that. And tomorrow, the opportunity to be one of the lucky people entering the ClearSight Advanced Program is open for a few days. This is like the university registrations are open just for a few days. So you can grab the opportunity to have the support of the team, of the ClearSight Method team, and to be in a process with a group of people who will be living this transformation with you so that you can have the fastest and safest and most fun um, path to transform your eyesight and everything that it implies with your health and your life and your well-being. So thank you for having been here. Congratulations, because you're already walking that path. If you're here, it means that you're taking care of your eyesight and your life and your health. So big applause for that. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for more. So in the meantime, take advantage of all this information so that you can see more and see better and enjoy the beauty of life. So see you tomorrow and thanks for having been here today.